welcome everyone to episode 46 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this week we're going to speak with an indie team from Astro Crow Games. They're working on a beautiful pixel art game formerly known as Highlight Heroes, just renamed Throwback Highlight Heroes. Uh, we get to chat with Karis, who focused on the pixel art, and Brian, who is the lead and sole developer of the game. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Doing great. Doing pretty well. Awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys coming on here. Um, I know we spoke last week about you coming on and we kind of chatted. Um, and then we found a date where we could all jump on and record. Um, I guess before we jump into everything, I just want to say if you like what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, it'd mean a lot to us if you'd like, share, and subscribe to the show, whether you're listening on the podcast or watching on YouTube. If you want to support us on Patreon, it helps us improve the show and bring on more guests. So I guess to just jump right in with you guys, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you have worked on with the game. All right, uh, I guess I'll start first. Um, so I started Astro Crow about 11 years now, 12 years now, when I got laid off of a, a job I was doing uh, educational video games known as uh, Serious Gaming. And at that time I'd always been working for other developers and I just kind of wanted to start my own thing. Uh, you know. The, the, the dream always to have your own ideas. And so I called an artist friend of mine that day, like as I'm walking out of the office and just started coming up with some games and had to start from scratch. You know, we started learning how to use the engines right there. And um, I think this year we put out 18 games total. They're all mobile games on um, iPhone and Android. And, you know, a lot of them have been actually taken down recently because uh, we just haven't been maintaining them. Uh, they do a lot of that uh, because we realized that it's very, very hard to have a sustainable business on mobile. So we decided to shift over to uh, to doing uh, arcade and doing console and things like that. And so uh, beyond that, I've been working uh, as an instructor, a video game uh, design teacher at a, uh, a college. And I also do uh, VR using Unity for... Um, uh, the AEC industry. And um, so for, for this game, I, I well, for Astro Crow in general, I pretty much do all of the uh, concept for the games, the game mechanics, and then I'll usually find one other artist to work with me and they'll be my, my sole artist. And um, I'll occasionally do uh, music and sound design, stuff like that, because I also have a, a music background. Awesome. How about you, Karis? So let's see. I am... Um... I started working in Unity, uh, making indie games, um, trying to lend my skills the best way I could. Um, just, you know, wanted to get better at it because um, I went to school for computer animation and ended up graduating in game art because I was like the first time I experienced Unity and the first time I experienced uh, Python in particular, it was the first thing that I really didn't get, like the first time that I tried it. Um, and it made me really angry. So I just continued to try to get better at it. Um, and I got like extra tutoring. Like I asked my teacher to fail me, like there's this whole thing. And that ended up being what my, my career became because it was so intellectually stimulating to me that I just didn't want to stop. So I started picking up all these different indie games that I wanted to uh, do on the side. Um, I started working uh, with a bunch of different projects. And one of the projects that I picked up um, when I first met Brian and we were uh, working in the same uh, place. And he was like, hey, I've got this concept. Do you think we could uh, work on some, uh, like, just basic art? And I was like, okay, I'll give you three weeks. And we'll we'll come up with um, just the, the backbone of a game. And it ended up being super fun. And we just continued to polish it. And that's what we have here is this little game. Um, so me as an artist, you know, I grew up with, you know, Jazz Jackrabbit and Chip, Chips Challenge, as well as, you, of course, the SNES and the NES and everything like that. But um, I just used to uh, use Microsoft Paint to draw and create my own pixel art characters at a very young age, because that was basically all I had. I just wanted to make what I saw on the screen. Like, I wanted to make Jazz Jackrabbit and his girlfriend kiss. Like, that's all I wanted to do. So, um <laughs> <laughs> I would create these games or sorry, these, uh, these, I would do pixel art a lot in like Microsoft paint and I would remake like Disney princesses and stuff like that. And as I got older, it, you know, it developed into like digital art and stuff and obviously going to school for, for games and stuff. 
I'm now a technical artist, which means that I program and I do the art. Um, so my my job now is I work for uh, a, a game platform company and or a game engine company, and I do professional services for the government. And that's super fun. And it's exactly what I always wanted to do, like creating cool experiences that like have impactful change and impactful, like, um, you know, that, that do something really awesome. Uh, so I'm really glad that I get to do that. And then when I'm not doing that, I like using my artwork to make Jazz Jackrabbit, uh, you know, like I used to. So I like doing pixel art. It's like my favorite thing to do. Um, and so this game uh, in particular, Highlight Heroes, I hope that you think that it's cool and it's fun because I think it's cool and it's fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the game looks fantastic. That was the first thing that really got me was the art drew me in and then the gameplay looked like it was just a blast. I, I can't wait to give it a try because I haven't actually played it yet, but I've seen the <laughs> videos of it. Um, I guess the question comes for Brian next and then Karis can kind of throw in because I guess it's probably his idea. Um, <laughs> it's where did the idea from for Highlight Heroes come from? Um, was it your idea originally? Was it something that you worked on a long time ago and then just kind of brought it off the shelf? Like where did that all come from and how did it come to be? It's actually a little bit of both. That was a, a good a good read. Um, so I grew up in South Florida. And for those of you who are listening, probably from anywhere not in Florida, like not in the South, you probably haven't really heard of Highlight that much. Um, to give a little background, it was a, a sport that originated in uh, the Basque region of Europe, which is on the border of France and Spain. And it got brought to America via Florida um, in like, I want to say like the 1940s or something like that. And they started popping up these little uh, arenas. They're called frontons all across America. Um, and it was very popular throughout the 60s to like the 80s. And then it had like a sharp decline. And uh, a lot of them closed down. And really the only ones that are left open are in Florida. So uh, especially in South Florida. So I actually had a close relationship to it because my grandfather actually worked at the one in South Florida. And my dad's best friend was a... Uh, like one of the higher ups at another uh, highlight place. So I'd go there a lot. And it wasn't until I was a little bit older, I realized like not a lot of people have heard of this sport. It's very uh, kind of fringe and obscure. Uh, so when I started Astro Crow, like I mentioned before, like the day I, I quit my job, uh, as I was working on our first game, The Last Days of Space, I was also waiting on art all the time because um, I was just really gung ho and just trying to get something done. So I'd keep making these little ideas. And I had about six or seven different demos. And at one point I wanted to make a sports game, but I'm like, what can I do to stand out? What could I make that, that would be different than what's out there? And I was like, I can make a highlight game. I don't think anyone's made a highlight game. It turns out there were like two highlight games made that were, you know, long forgotten and obscure in like the eighties. But uh, I started making it for mobile and I realized I didn't really like the control scheme. Mobile is very tricky when trying to make a sports game. It's not kind of slippery, if that makes sense, if you, especially using like an analog like a fake analog controller. So I kind of shelved it, was working on some other products. And then um, what I would do as I, as I taught my class during lab hours, um, I'd always put something up on the projection screen so my students could see me working on something. And I would usually start like a new project and just make some random fun little game. And they could see it start from, you know, from inception to rough completion, like to get all the mechanics implemented. And so I was like, what could I do? And I'm like, I started remembering all of a sudden it hit me. And this was like, eight years later, honestly, I was like, oh yeah, I made a highlight game once, but it was mobile. It wasn't very fun. What if I made it with a, with an actual like control pad? Uh, and so I started with that and it was literally just little, uh, just shapes, little blocks. And, um, my idea behind it was I wanted to make the NBA jam NFL blitz of highlight, right? So it, it's quick to get into, it's quick to learn, but it, it's a little bit harder to master and it's very fun to play very frantic very fast paced. Um, and I had this idea of a certain type of like art style that I wanted this kind of like cartoony, like retro, uh, late eighties, early nineties style. We were thinking like saved by the bell meets Miami vice and everyone that kept definitely came through. Yeah. 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 Um, we, we, we worked hard on that. Right. Uh, and I, um, everyone was recommending me at where I worked, uh, this girl, Karis, they're like, Oh, Karis does pixel art. You should, uh, should ask her and so i you know she worked with me but I, I she worked on the same floor as me but i never actually talked to her so i was like hey how's it going uh, i had this game i'd like to see if you'd like to do some artwork for it and um it grew from there and we started off with like kind of like rough you know uh first done over um 
like versions of the artwork. And then uh, I took it to a convention. And at that time I was also working on like three other projects. I think I actually had Karis doing the art for another one for a temporary amount of time. And uh, out of all my games I've ever shown, for some reason, everyone seemed to flock towards Highlight Heroes. Uh, I was getting people who told me who played all my games. They were like, listen, man, this is like your best one. Like you, this is, you got something with this. And this was even when it was super early, like just having the controls where you could throw the ball and bounce off the walls and dash. Uh, people were really into it. So it, it kind of drove me to devote most of my time and my focus outside of work on the game. Uh, and uh, as we've been doing that, we've been getting a lot of really positive feedback, which has driven us further to, to keep to keep doing it. And uh, that's where we are today. Yeah, I guess I'll just throw it over to Karis then. What was that <laughs> like when he approached you and asked you to work on the game? Yeah, so um, uh, it was definitely a, hey, I got this game. Uh, do you want to work on it? And I have, uh, I'm, I'm like, like a workhorse and I'm also very stubborn and I'm also very excitable. So uh, if something seems like it's a project that's um, along the lines of what I want to do, um, then I'll, I'll just be like, yeah, okay, let's do it. All right, let's go. Let's, um, let's get this done. All right. Uh, so you want this, 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 we're going to come up with a definition. Also, like I, I was in a mode where I was working on one to 10 games per month and they would refresh every month. So I knew that I could get at least the base amount of art done in a, approximately uh, three weeks. And it's something that I was used to, and I kind of wanted to just, just do it. And I, I wanted to get a lot of portfolio pieces under my belt, that kind of thing. So I was like, yeah, come on, let's go. And so I just started doing the thing I do, like be, as an art director, I was like, okay, um, let's define a sentence that's going to define this game. And uh, let's get the base number of assets. How many animations do you need? How many characters? Okay, you only need one, but we're gonna duplicate them. We're gonna flip out his colors. Um, okay, what makes him unique? Let's do some research on highlight. Let's go, let's go. And I remember that the sentence we came up with was um, Hotline Miami during the day made by Behemoth. And we came up with five colors that would be our color scheme. And we kept those things consistent throughout the project. Um, <laughs> So obviously like made by behemoth as in like the little characters are, are squishy and I, I was approaching the the one character, you know, because all four characters are the same one duplicated with some color swaps um, where, you know, he would have a lot of principles in the animation like stuck, like stuffed into this little, you know, 16 by 16 sprite. So he's got like, like when I first approached the character design, I wanted that to be like steeped in the 12 principles of animation. So uh, one, the, the top half of him is all like secondary animation and the bottom of half of him is all squ squash and stretch. So if you watch some of his animations, he's very um, stretchy, bubbly, bouncy, rubbery, but then there are certain elements of him, like he's too cool to be wearing the strap on his helmet, which was something consistently we saw when we were looking at different highlight footage from back in the uh, late eighties and early nineties that you know, it was too cool to be safe. So a lot of them had like their helmet strap, you know, dangling off their helmet or like they were chewing on it or something. Cause that was just a very like early nineties things to do. It was just too cool to be safe. Which so. is crazy because of how <laughs> fast that ball is moving. Yes, while the game it's actually the fastest ball sport in the world, except for recently, I think golf took the spot, but 188 miles per hour. Yeah, but and that this... golf ball is not coming back at your face. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And like a lot of people have actually died playing this game, not our video game, of course, but the game itself, it's an important distinction. Um, yeah, it, 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 like when they do autop autopsies of these people, they find shards of their skull embedded in their brain. Like that's how intense it is. Uh, but yeah, let's like, let's not secure our, our helmets. So I thought that that was super hilarious. And so I made it so that the helmet is never secured on top of the, the player's head. A bunch of things like that. I remember um, just drawing on whiteboards over and over and over, like creating these arcs and these arches for like the beautiful like swings that these players would do. And uh, ended up being pretty uh, interesting because people were like watching what I was doing. Like, Karis, what are you making? And I ended up like these, there's like, these like capsule dudes with just these arcs uh, over and over and over, like constantly. I was just trying to get the, 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 the rhythm down, you know? Um, so yeah, it, it, after three weeks, we had a fully um, realized like direction for the artwork. And after that, it became super simple in our hobby time to just add a few more assets here and there. And um, 
you know, it, it, we continue to do that until it started to pick up some momentum. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can really see it in the characters and the movement and just like the physics look really realistic and they, I mean, all the characters look great. Gameplay looks great. Yeah. Um, I guess throughout development, uh, whether that be developing the game or the art, what were some roadblocks that you guys hit? What what was something that, that was troubling or difficult to overcome? Sure. Um, so definitely what we've had to do to make things better for beginners, we had a predictor that shows on the, on the ground where the ball is going to land. And initially with the earlier versions of Unity, it was very, very tough to do. I actually had to look up like physics equations. And now they have stuff where I can actually step forward the, the physics engine and I can, so I basically te to get technical. I kind of freeze the entire game on like a frame and the ball does its physics, figures out where it's going to land. We put a decal on the ground and then we reverse the physics and then play it again. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like uh, going back in time. Right. But that was, that was something very, very difficult to set up. Um, other issues we had was transitioning when we decided to go arcade to make it an arcade, make it an arcade exclusive uh, we went from analog sticks, and at first we were going to try and maybe do analog sticks for the arcade, but we re realized kind of how expensive those are, right? Um, so I had to convert the controls down to uh, eight-way and kind of do like a simulated analog, which there, there are ways that people have done that on console games where you kind of uh, tween in between the directions as you change them so it feels a little bit analog. Uh, those are some technical challenges. Other than that... Uh, that, that, that's like the main problems that we had. There haven't been too many technical challenges. It's just that uh, things take a lot of time, just trying to find the right time to, to, to work on it. Yeah, any big uh, art hiccups? I remember uh, the first time we debuted it, everyone thought the player character was a dolphin <laughs> uh, or a penguin. Like it was, it was a toss up between the two. No one could understand exactly what he was at first, but everyone agreed that he was cute. And that's what would matter. What matters. That's important. So, yep. <laughs> it's a very important thing. So I think that it, it said even more that like it wasn't super sure what the design was, but his movements and like his general behaviors were appealing. And I think that says a lot about um, the the direction we're going. And you couldn't tell that it was a human, but it didn't matter. And um, I, I, it's just a. It ended up being like a a hiccup that turned into a positive. Uh, then we reworked the design, and everyone can tell who he is now. But. Um, uh, but, you know, it's just, there's, there's always like just creating tons and tons of assets all the time. I, it's not really as much of a hiccup, I guess. Um, continuing to work with deprecated software is always an issue. Um, you know, trying to keep the, the, uh, the workflow consistent while things are, you know, updating or either going, uh, phasing out and that kind of thing. It's always hard to deal with, but, um, yeah, and then just like generally uh, running out of space for all your animations, you know, trying to create more animations. And I don't know. The whole process is fun um, as far as like drawbacks or setbacks. Uh, it's just like, you know, this is just a hobby. So, you know, there's never enough time in the day to do all the stuff that you want to do. Right. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll definitely send you a... Um... We'll definitely send you a uh, picture of the dolphin version of the character you can <laughs> on screen. Yeah, I, I definitely want to see some of the, the earlier renderings of the, <laughs> of the game to see kind of how it progressed through time. Yeah, we can do that. Um, I guess I have another question for you, Karis, and that is um, pixel art. Why pixel mm -hmm. art over anything else? And I guess, Brian, you can chime in on this too. Um, was that your original view for the game, that you wanted to go pixel art, or were you looking a little more realistic? Yeah, um, I know what he's going to say. We, we originally were like pixel art. Like that was just... Um, it. it it just immediately was appealing for like the the heyday of high ally which was the late 80s and early 90s i thought that the the time period just matched and then you know um me personally i wanted an opportunity to exercise my uh my pixel art and um i'll take it any excuse <laughs> so i was like hey the pixel art will work and it's in this particular case it wasn't like a square peg in a round hole it actually worked out pretty well um so I, I'm 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 happy with how it ended up. So for for me, we were actually trying to save time by using the 3D world of Unity, but I was going to make the camera orthographic, so mm -hmm. it would look like a 2D game. And then we realized once we unlocked the the perspective camera, it actually looked really neat to do this hybrid thing 
Um, and whatever, you know, we decided on, on pixel art, but uh, I knew it had to have hand-drawn animation. I'm a big, big fan of hand-drawn animations and in all of my games. I always try and get that uh, from my artists if they can, uh, if they're down to do that. Uh, and so luckily Karis is really, really good at it. And we got some really nice looking animations. And so um, there were times where we thought like, maybe we should convert all this to 3D but uh, people still really enjoyed it. So we have like a hybrid. Uh, so certain levels, there's like a, a beach ball, right? The beach ball is an actual 3D sphere, but we put a tune shader on it. So it kind of looks like it matches the style. And that seems to work out pretty well. Um, but everything outside of the character and the balls are actually um, 3D assets. Gotcha. Is pixel art uh, usually your preferred method of art for a game, Brian? I mean, you said you've made a whole bunch of them. Is that usually the route you go? Yes, uh, unless it doesn't fit the aesthetic, like whatever we're going for. So one game I made was called Word Fail, and the whole theme was you're texting your friends on your phone and you're making grammatical mistakes and you have to correct them. <laughs> and um, that, we had to make it look like the iPhone, right? So it, it had to have the exact same setup. Right. But if I can, yeah, I love pixel art. I love what people are doing nowadays with, with pixel art. I, I just, a lot of really talented artists use use it, use that, 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 uh, that medium, right? And it's funny because I've read whole arguments about why artists who used to work on pixel art in retro games back in the 80s and, and 90s say that they shouldn't want it as an aesthetic. But I guess just growing up with it, uh, we all love it, right? They were saying, I read this one article, the guy was saying something like, if you looked on the back of the box back in the day or the front of the box, that's what we wish we could do. But we were limited by the uh, the technology at the time. So we don't understand why you want that. Like Mega Man's supposed to look like the cartoon Mega Man, not the little pixel guy. Right. But it just it just has this really nice uh, aesthetic, like a minimalist type of thing. Um, I like that trying to do the most out of a little um, little bit of uh, requirements, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love pixel art. I think it looks fantastic compared to, I mean, when you're just looking at like big AAA games nowadays, everything is made in Unreal Engine and everything looks the same. You know, there's, there's tiny differences between each game. Uh, but when you look at a pixel game, like they can look dramatically different. And it, it really does come down to the artist's preferred method and their style. There, there's way more style personally in, in my eyes in pixel art than there is in just like the generic triple uh, a stuff that's coming out nowadays um i guess a question that i'm curious about for you guys is why an arcade cabinet like i know that this is something that you kind of have come to a decision with fairly recently um but was that kind of the original direction and why did you decide i mean as an arcade guy why, why did you decide to go to the arcade Okay. Um, yeah, there's a long history leading up to this. So originally, like I said, I was going to make the game mobile. I realized mobile is not the best market, especially 10 years since I tried to get in. Um, at the beginning, it, it might have been a possibility, but now it's, it's so so hard to stand out when there's so many games that are just being piped through that, 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 that a marketplace. Um, so I, I said to myself, oh, I'm going to put this on, on the Switch. And I actually pitched it to Nintendo and we were in talks and I was going to get a dev kit. Um, they liked it by the way like it was it was kind of funny just a side story like i literally just cold cold called uh nintendo at e3 i just walked i was waiting in line to play some game and i, I saw nintendo's booth and i was like you know i'm just gonna walk over there and i pulled up on youtube the trailer for highlight heroes i'm like what do you guys think of this and he's like i love it here's uh my car um <laughs> but uh we never went through with it because i started thinking well you know it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to be hard to do all the marketing so it'd be better if we grew it organically on steam uh do like a steam green light type thing back when they had green light and we started to, to prep for that and then i started uh looking more into the indie arcade scene i started seeing stuff about killer queen um i was going to uh free play florida which you see both karis and i both have the, <laughs> the poster on our uh behind us and um it's a event for those who don't know where they, they all these local uh, operators and, and guys who are arcade enthusiasts bring out tons of arcade and pinball machines and they're all free to play. And so it was a really fun event. And I started seeing these other uh, indie arcade uh, games showing up there, namely uh, Cosmotrons was one of, the, one of the big ones there. And we just started talking with people and it seemed more and more like, like I was curious about this. And then as I was meeting more people, it seemed like it's actually a very feasible thing to do. It's not um, the most mainstream thing, right? But it's this cool way to kind of have your own uh, niche in, in the video game world. And also the game I felt itself because it was modeled after NBA Jam and NFL Blitz, those are two very 
uh, successful arcade games. And it would be something that could kind of uh, be like a modernized, more cartoony version of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Karis, were you excited about that going to the arcade once you kind of found out that that was a direction you guys were thinking about? Yeah. So um, as a uh, as an enthusiast, you know, I'm watching like GDC talks and everything. We, I was aware of everything that, um, you know, like Bumble Bear was doing. And I just thought it was the coolest, like underground punk rock thing I'd ever heard of. Um, and I like until I like got to see it myself. Right. I still carried that opinion and I was still like blown out of the water. But um, basically, as soon as it came up, I was like, hey, what if we went arcade exclusive? It was like, uh, yeah, like it just made too much sense. Like if we were going to go to the the home version, that would be great. Um, but like, why not, right? It's such like all of the the interactions that we designed into the user interface were designed around being physically next to somebody else and having a conversation and getting to know someone new and talking like literally just you know camaraderie and communication and that real true couch co op experience, right? And um, making it arcade exclusive just made too much sense. Um, so as soon as the thought came across, it was just like, okay, yes. And now let's go. Like, like, let's go. Like it, it just, yeah, it was really exciting at the first moment I heard about it. And I was like, let's, let's just go, let's do this. Yeah. I love that you guys kind of got introduced to the scene through killer queen and Cosmotrons cause they're both fantastic games and the guys behind them are awesome. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys probably met like Nikita and Shane and Dave and Brian and all them mm -hmm. um, and Josh and they're every time I meet any of those guys, it's, it's always a great time to see them. Um, and I guess last week I just did an episode with MGC and it's a convention in Milwaukee and that's where I met, um, I met the Cosmotron guys. I met death ball, which Tony, I met DSM who made switch and shoot like, all of these guys are now down in, I know it's pretty close to you, like, like Glitch Bar Arcade. Um, so if anybody's in South Florida and knows where Glitch Bar is in Fort Lauderdale and you want to try any of these games, that's that's the place to go. They, I think they have every single one, including Black Emperor. Um, yes. So I guess on the side of indie games and future indie developers, what kind of advice would you give to people that are interested in making a game from a development standpoint and from an art standpoint? Okay. Uh from a development standpoint, it's a lot more work than you think. Um, <laughs> I will I will say that. Got to um, be honest, right out of the gate. It, it is a lot more work than you think. Um, I always tell my students, like, it's less about the idea and more about the execution. Like, what is what is throwback highlight heroes? On paper, it's uh, NBA Jam, but highlight. And now we've been, it's about four and a half years in development, right? So that's not just because we also work full-time jobs, uh, but it's because to make something where I feel comfortable releasing it, saying like, this is a, a well-polished game with no bugs, no game-breaking bugs and no, um, you know, inconsistencies in the art and everything looks nice and feels nice. And like, it takes so much more than you think. Like the, I've had the, the controller, the actual like control scheme for the game has roughly been the same since the first like three months of development. I've rolled with that and we just added extra polish on top. I fixed little bugs. I've added more things that communicate things to the player. Like how do they know whose turn it is? How do they know where the ball is going to land? How do they know um, if a point is about to be scored uh, and the game's over? Things like that. How many credits you have left? So that's all the minutia that ends up taking up all of that time where the, the initial like prototype, right? The vertical slice or whatever you have you, that takes no time at all. And, and so many indie devs, they end up, uh, getting very frustrated and just leaving once they, they, they see they have the potential in a product or whatever game. And then they, <laughs> they realize, Oh no, to get all of this working, to get all of this, uh, uh, captivating and, um, work feeling good and playing well and having a good balance that takes way too much time. And I see a lot of, of people who just drop off at that point. So you have to have a good, uh, wherewithal. You also have to make sure you don't scope yourself too large. Uh, so many students, they say, I've got an idea for a game. I go, let me guess. Is it an MMO with where the choices uh, you do greatly affect the outcome of the game? They're like, yes. I'm like, you will not do that. You will never finish that game. It will not be done. Um, so you have to think small. And then, you know, if it has some sort of success or there's some uh, momentum behind it, then you can put more time and effort and maybe hire more people. But it's also very, you have to be kind of humble. Um, and if you go in thinking your first game is going to make you a million dollars, you might be very disappointed. Also, 
uh, you might be a little delusional when you go to show people and you're like, look how awesome this game is. And you've ignored the fact that there's other games that exist. And then you, you're like, what about my game would stand out? Why would someone play my game as opposed to someone else's? And you know, you can still make that as like a hobbyist, but if you go into an actual marketplace, there has to be a reason that someone would choose your game other than the fact that they know you, right? It, like if they would choose yours out of a lineup, not knowing who made it. Uh, so you have to have a lot of uh, work ethic to, to get it to that point. Time and patience. Mm -hmm. Art. So it's a lot more work than you think. Um, <laughs> I think we I, heard that from someone. <laughs> yeah, no, it's seriously. Um, like, like I said, the first three weeks that we worked on this, we created a framework of the whole product. And I would stick by that. Anybody who wants to make their own, you know, make a sentence, decide the art direction early and don't deviate from that. Decide your color palette and don't deviate from that. Um, and, and all those things are great, but they're just the starting point because after that, it's the hours and hours of grueling, uh, you know, asset development and, 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 you know, animation work. And, you know, even if your idea is as silly as let's add a hats um you're going to be uh signing yourself up for hours and hours of of work you know where your 1024 by 1024 character sheet has you know 200 frames in it and each of those 200 frames now needs a pirate hat um and that is just one of your many hats that you need to create right so um uh you know uh, in addition to just that um so if, if, you are, if, if you are making a game and you're working on the artwork, um, I would recommend, of course, using texture atlases and sprite sheets. Um, but more than that, like plan for future assets in your sprite sheets so that you don't have to um, change the dimensions of it retroactively. And um, th this is something that I continue to do on purpose. Like, it, even if I make a small asset, I will make sure that the texture atlas is a little bit larger to anticipate future and uh, sprites and other things that I can imp uh, implement into that same sheet. Of course, keeping everything into the grid uh, and keeping the grid consistent because if not, you're going to have to redo all that work and you're going to have a somebody's going to be grumbling about it, right? Um, uh, you know, don't be afraid to just have fun. Um, and the more fun that you have making your assets, I, I believe strongly, the more fun is carried through when someone is playing it. Um, you know, make sure to, and I've already mentioned this, but make sure you practice all of your 12 principles of animation and just pack it in, in there as much as you can, if that's your jam in the game that you're making, right? Not all games have to be like that. Some of them can be very stoic and very uh, uh, static. You know, there's a lot of beautiful games that are like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love doing this. And if anybody else wants to do this too, just know what you're signing up for, because it seems like, um, it seems like it's easier than, than programming. Um, but someone who also programs, um, I know that it's just a different kind of hard and, you know, and that that's not to be, uh, just kind of glazed over. You have to use an entirely different part of your visual spatial brain to to accomplish much more complicated and diverse tasks, uh, even though everything that Brian does is important. Everything that I do is important. And if either of us is not um, maintaining our side of things, the game isn't going to be as successful. Um, you know, you, you can't have cool looking art and OK gameplay. You have to have, you know, one or the other, and preferably you got both. So uh, it just makes everything better, right? I'll say that you also <laughs> have to um, communicate with each other, so that way you can be they can work together, right? So not even the, all disciplines. So it's like not just the art. The artist has to talk to the the sound designer as well as the gameplay designer, and then it creates that effect on the player where it's subliminal and it just works and it just feels right. So when we added new artwork and sound effects to the player controller. All these people were giving me compliments on how well I've tweaked the gameplay. 
and I just say thank you, awesome. <laughs> they didn't know that it's been the exact same gameplay model. I'm like, yeah, I've been really working hard, mm-hmm. um, but it's because everything just comes together and makes that like perfect storm of that that illusion in your head of like, oh, this is that character. I am that character. I'm I'm controlling him in this world. Balance. I think the word of the day is balance. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. uh, you, you need that. <laughs> you can't have one without the other. Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing time, passion, focus, balance, understand understand what you're getting into. Yes, hard work, uh, things like that. N- neurotic dedication to a task, despite all, uh, every everybody who says that it's, it's you know, despite all odds um, and all the naysayers, consistent and dedicated work. The 2020, um, the 20 minute minimum or the 20 min min, Meaning, uh, as far as like task, um, yeah, delegation and and task management. Um, even if you don't want to do that thing, you set aside twenty minutes and you tell yourself, "Okay, I'm going to do this one task for twenty minutes." Because the hardest part is jumping into a cold pool and getting started, right? But once you're in there, it's not so bad. So as long as you do it for that twenty minutes, you know, maybe you're like, "Ah, I'm not over it. I want to go do something else." cool. Your brain's going to get that dopamine hit and it's going to be like, that was cool. I'm going to do that again next time because my brain completed a task that I set out myself and I set out to do it and I did it. And then, um, but what's more likely is that the hardest part of getting started was just getting started. And then once you're in there, it's not so bad and you end up working for an hour or two and that's an hour or two more than you would have done that day. I think uh, procrastination tends to be logarithmic. So like if you go, you have to, if you have to set aside as if it's like an obligation, because if you go a day without working on your game and you're used to doing it every day, then it's easier to do three days. And all of a sudden you're going a week and then three months later, you're like, shouldn't I be working on my game? Didn't I want to release that eventually? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you're right. It, it's easier to go from 10 to a hundred than it is from zero to 10. Like you just, you just gotta get that momentum going and then it all just compounds and continues rolling. Um, I guess question for each of you about your gaming history, where did you guys get started and what are you playing nowadays? Terrace, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, my first game was descent on the MS DOS. Uh, my dad pulled me up in his lap and gave me my first gamer tag. I didn't know what that was at the time, but I enjoyed it. Um, and in general, like my brother and I would go over to my grandpa, grandpa's house and he had a uh, Nintendo and we would play three different cartridges over and over and over again. And that was um, the uh, combination Mario Duck Hunt, the Rampage cartridge, and um, this game called Prisoner of War. If you've heard of it, please let me know because I feel like I made it up at this point. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was just what we played over and over and over again, and um, until we eventually got, you know, Sega Genesis, et cetera, et cetera, um, and that that whole business. But um, yeah, I, I played a lot of floppy disk games. I already mentioned my favorite, um, Jazz Jack Rabbit, and you know those those types of games. Um, all of them were pretty much pixel art games. And then what am I playing now? Um, Starcraft 2, thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's that's just not going to change anytime soon. Um, it's the only game that I like, and it's it's uh, it, I will play it every possible chance that I get. I will play it in order to celebrate getting things done. I will play it to prevent myself from getting things done. Um, it's not a problem, I promise. Anyway, yeah, so Starcraft 2, I'm a Terran. I'm um, trying really hard to get to gold. And, <laughs> yeah, Brian's laughing at me. What is your favorite game, Brian? Go ahead and tell me. Let's uh, start with the first part. Well, yeah, so uh, I started, I mean, earliest gaming memory. I, my parents had a 2600 when I was like three or four. I remember playing Donkey Kong and tennis and all that stuff, Breakout. Um, and, and just I was really uh, into knowing as much as I could about games, uh, by the time the internet was finally, um, a, uh, what do you call it? Affordable, I guess would be a good term. I started using a lot of resources to educate myself on like gaming history and a lot of famous games that I would never have had the opportunity to play besides that. So I made myself very uh, acquainted with that. Um, and then, you know, uh, being very busy, nowadays because i i do work two full-time jobs and do this on the side and i play drums in a band 
and uh, I have some side projects. Uh, there's not a lot of time, so I've had to really shift my my gaming focus to a lot of um, quick in, quick out games. So um, one of my favorite games of all time is actually Tetris Attack. That that game is just the perfect blend of quick in, quick out, easy to learn, hard to master, um, simple gameplay but very deep. And uh, I've always I've always loved that. But um, what I find myself going back to is usually StarCraft 2 and um, Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. I play a lot of that because if I want to get a gaming fix, you know, it's only like uh, Third Strike is only like five minutes around but or match, but like, uh, you know, StarCraft 2 can go a little bit long. But um, I, I, I can't really do like the, the long form gaming just because I don't have the time. I, I have a huge stack of, of games that I keep buying and I shouldn't because I never have time. Like I think I have every PlayStation 4 game that's 60 hours plus, and they all have been like one hour of play. So I, I've been trying to dig through them. Like lately, I've been playing the new God of War because I just had it in the plastic wrap forever. Um, and I promised myself I had to beat God of War 3 remastered first, and so I, I did that. But um, I, I would like, I would love to play more long form stuff, but there's just not a, not a time thing. So I, I love those games that are just very quick, and there's a very tight controls, and it's, it's very intuitive. Um, anything like that is really fun, which is great because the game we're working on is kind of like that. <laughs> so I don't mind jumping into playtest. Yeah, I totally understand that. I mean, I'm I'm the same way. I started out with some of the early stuff, and no matter how many games I play, indie games, long form games, anything, I always get pulled back into either World of Warcraft or League of Legends, and it's just nice. back and forth between the two. Just quit playing WoW a couple months ago, started playing League again, probably get back <laughs> into WoW in like six months, then play League again. It's just constant back and forth. So those um, are the two I've literally banned myself from playing because I know I could all my whole life would go get crumbling. <laughs> yeah, you focus in on them a lot, and then uh, you get sick of them, and you realize that you just played way too much the last couple months, and uh, wish you had some of that time back, but it's gone at that point. So um, there's a quick story, real quick. Um, I gotta explain to my bitterness. Um, so I think I think. It was probably like three years of working on High Ally Heroes before like the like question even came up. Hey, what's your favorite game? Right. Um, While well, we're working on something and I was like, oh, I like Starcraft 2. He's like, no, you don't. And I was like, yeah, I do. And it was more of like, no, because that's my favorite game kind of thing. And he didn't have um, like a laptop he could play on at the time. And I didn't really either and hadn't played for a really long time. So we told ourselves that um, once we got to a certain point with our uh, like our, our pitch and our development, uh, like our releaseable product, right? That we would finally play each other in StarCraft II. And that was like a year or two ago. And uh, so now it's just a, it's a blood feud. Blood feud. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna answer which of us won. Me. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, that one. Anyway, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I like that you guys that that was something that you kind of had in common and you set a goal. Um, I guess a question for you guys is when is the game going to be coming out? Like, when will this be an option to play? And what are your guys' plans for the cabinet? Okay. Um, very good question again. We, we actually just hit a milestone where we um, have the entire arcade version of the game loop, loop from the uh, title screen or track mode all the way to the end of the game back to the beginning without any game breaking bugs or significant errors and, uh, and all the artwork in there and all the sound effects. That always so, feels good. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, but that's still so much more to go, right? Uh, so much more we could add. Um, and we've also gone into the transitioning of the name. I think it's, we kind of didn't fully talk about that, but we did call it, we were calling the game highlight heroes, but we realized for people who aren't from Florida and even people who are in Florida who just never really paid attention, um, not many people have heard of the sport. They can't spell it and they can't pronounce it right. So we realize we have to kind of pivot as a way to make it more marketable or recognizable to other people. So we, we spent a long time thinking about that and we were like, I really don't want to get rid of Highlight Heroes because that's like the whole uniqueness of it. And for those who don't know what Highlight is, by the way, I, I know I didn't mention it. It's like racquetball where one person throws it at the wall, the other team grabs it and has to throw it back before it bounces twice or you get a point. Um, but it's much larger than a racquetball court and you have a basket tied to your hand. And that's like the novelty, this thing called a Sesta and you just whip it at the, at the, at the ball. Um, so we wanted people to recognize that this is actually the sport of high lie, 
uh, instead of just calling it some random thing like like uh, hot potato wall ball or something. But um, balls to the wall. Balls to the wall. So so we 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 thought for a long time, and we actually came up with a really good compromise of calling it throwback because because what do you do in the game? You throw it back. It's like as simple as possible. So it's now throwback colon highlight heroes. Uh, for those who have been following it, they can still realize what game this is and so we've done the conversion of updating all the logos and the in-game artwork to kind of express that uh now we're at the tricky part of we need to find someone who's willing to do the uh the mechanical side of it we, we've in the sales of it like we've we've designed kind of a mock-up for what we want the cabinet to look like and the artwork and things like that uh what components we would use but uh, we just don't have the time and the bandwidth right now because of our, our obligations with jobs and, and life and stuff like that. Um, so we'd love to have somebody we could, we're, we're really looking for someone who'd be willing to take on the uh, manufacturing of the cabinets as well as the sales side of things. Um, that's, that's our current dilemma right now. So if anybody watching has any uh, uh, lines, you can, you can reach us, uh, Brian at astrocrow.com, Brian with an I. We've got a dilemma. I'd love to hear from you. Trying to make the lemonade. <laughs> there you go. Well, this is definitely the place to go. I mean, everybody that's watching the show um, is involved in the scene, and we've got plenty of people in the Discord that we can communicate with, and I'm sure we can talk afterwards to, to help you guys at least get on the right track. Um, I guess that's pretty much any everything that I had to ask you guys. Um, I guess to wrap everything up, just throw out those social media links so that we can find you, uh, whether they be personal or for the game. Karis? So my personal art Instagram is Karis.captures. That's C-A-R-I-S dot C-A-P-T-U-R-E-S. And um, for our game, we have Instagram at Astro Crow Games. And uh, we also have a Reddit, r slash Highlight Heroes. And we have a Facebook, Highlight Heroes. And Facebook at Astro... Uh, Facebook Astro Crow Games, right? Yeah, most most social media, it's either Astro Crow or Astro Crow Games, one or the other. Just just try it, <laughs> oh, <laughs> find out. It's <laughs> probably a better way to say all those things. But uh, we do have a graphic we can give you that has everything you can throw up on the screen. Definitely, I will throw that up at the end. Anything for you, Brian? Uh, no, I I don't like being on social media. <laughs> it takes up too much of my time, and there's no good that comes from it. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we got you for uh, all the highlight hero stuff. Uh, throwback. Highlight Heroes, that is, um, since we'll be getting that, the upgraded uh, graphics and everything for that. Um, I just want to thank you guys again for coming on to the show, telling everybody your story, letting us know a little bit about yourselves before the game comes out. And to anyone that's enjoying Indie Arcade Wave stuff, uh, don't forget to share, like, follow, stuff like that, um, as well as the Patreon did just launch. So if you want to support us there and help us grow the show, bring more guests on, we definitely appreciate that. Um, but until next time, peace. Thank you. Thank you.